If you have your Bibles with you, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. 1 Corinthians chapter 16. We're going to continue our series on look before you lead. So we're talking about leadership, but we're talking about all kinds of different aspects of it. And today I'm kind of, kind of be really about, uh, kind of expounding on leadership more than, than usually. But uh, if, if you're there, say amen. 1 Corinthians 16, say amen. Amen. All right, praise God. Say, preach it, pastor. Preach it, pastor. All right, let's go. Here we go. <laughs> Heavenly Father, <laughs> 1 Corinthians 16, 13, 14 says this, be on guard. I think you want to let's do something. Let's, let's all do this together. Okay, on three, we're going to all read it together. Ready? One, two, three. Three, be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be courageous, be strong, and do everything with love. Mm. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, oh God, that tonight you'll speak to every one of our hearts right where we are, and we just thank you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, in this series, we've been discussing the topic of leadership, and not just how we lead others, but also how we lead ourselves. We've been going to the Old Testament and looking at prophetic insights that we'll be reviewing even tonight, of course, but it's going to provide a kind of a, a, a divine understanding on this really important subject. Because how many know that every single one of us is a leader? See, you're a leader, and the most difficult person to lead is yourself. Because <laughs> how many know we know what to do, and sometimes we just... Don't do it. And, and, you know, don't feel too bad because even the Apostle Paul speaks about that in one of his letters where he says, man, he says, what a wretched man I am. I mean, imagine that. The Apostle Paul who wrote the 13 letters in the Bible, a scholar. I mean, this guy was amazing, had more degrees than a thermometer. Come on, somebody. And he was so educated and he struggled so much, just like the rest of us do because I'm of this flesh. I mean, you, you get saved, but this flesh, you got to keep it under. Come on, somebody. Because this flesh will rise back up again. That's why Paul said, listen, it's not I that lives, right? It's Jesus. It's Christ who lives in me. That's why I need to crucify myself daily. daily. That's right, because daily the flesh will try to rise back up again if you don't keep it subject to the spirit. So, you know, and of course, the prophetic insight is very important. And see, real leadership is being the person others will confidently follow. See, real leadership, it's not a title. It's, it's being able to influence others in a way that they actually want to follow what you're doing. Now, I've, I've had the great opportunity to work both with difficult people, come on, somebody, and great leaders as well. How many of you guys have had the boss from hell? Come on, somebody. Anybody? So the rest of you guys, uh, you are the boss from hell, right? No, just kidding. At the end of the day, we've had people that we've worked for, but we've also had people that we really enjoyed working for. And if you stop and think about it, like what makes the difference? See, I believe it's very, very important for us to understand this. See, a good leader leads people from above, from above them. See, a great leader leads people from within them. See, a good leader makes you feel good about your job. A great leader makes you feel good about yourself. See, it's never about the role. See, a good leader makes you feel good about things around you. It makes you feel good and confident. See, it's never about the role. It's always about the goal. See, when you lead, a lot of people that lead today, and, I, and I'll be honest with you, I, I've been here for a lot of years, and I never asked pastor for a position. Come on, somebody. He just kept giving me stuff. And, I, and I'll be honest with you, I was super reluctant to be a leader. I just, I just didn't see it, right? So, I, so pastor kept asking me to do things, and I would just do it, but I was just a reluctant leader. I just, I just didn't want, like, man, I just didn't want to do this, and, and I didn't know if I could. How many of you, when somebody asks, uh, asks you to be a leader in a position, the first thing you say is, who, me? Yeah. <laughs> it's like Moses, right? Moses go, uh, w w w wait, wait a minute, Lord. Uh, 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 can't talk too good. At the end of the day, when God begins to move you into leadership, how many know it's really easy to just start making excuses? And, and then knowing that you know yourself, we feel very disqualified because we know our shortcomings. So when God begins to promote you in those areas, then sometimes it's like, man, can't you pick somebody else? 
Like some, I know some people that might be a little bit more qualified to do this. But how many know that God qualifies the unqualified? Amen. How many know that sometimes the less of you there, that you have in you, the more God can use you? Because there's less of you, which make, makes more room for him. So you see, it's awesome when you start thinking about uh, a leadership. And see, I, I made a list of five of the hardest people you can lead. Now, you might find, I hope you find yourself, maybe you won't find yourself in this list of five. But, but listen to this. The first person that's hard to lead is this, the know-it-all. Come on, somebody. Uh, I'm, go I'm just going, I'm going there, y'all. <laughs> uh, listen, the know it anybody have, anybody try to lead somebody that knows everything? Come on, somebody. They know everything. Listen, at the, at the end of the day, if they know everything, they can learn nothing because they already know everything. They're experts in every area. And, and by the way, research behind after they give you all the facts, they start making stuff up as they go along. It doesn't sound good. Come on, man. So, so you have to know it all. That's, that's a hard person to lead. Here's the second one. You ready? Hypercritical people. Come on. People that always see the cup half empty. People that are always criticizing. People that always have a better way to do it. Come on, somebody. They've had 15 jobs in one year because they criticize everybody. They think they could do it better, and they keep getting fired because they're trying to tell the boss how to run his business. Come on, somebody. I know that's nobody in this room. <laughs> Hypercritical. Here's another one. Now, this is, this is, this is kind of real. Wounded people. Wounded people who've gone through a hard, maybe a hard situation, have a hard, maybe a difficult time of trusting. So that can be very difficult to get over. And then, and then sometimes, listen, hurt people hurt people. So you need to understand that a lot of times when somebody's going through a hurt, and, they, and, they, and, they, and of course, they're, not, they're feeling miserable because they've been through something, they've gone through something. Uh, how many know that pain will either make you bitter or it's going to make you better so at the end of the day how you interpret that makes a huge difference so sometimes when people are wounded it's hard to lead them because many times they don't trust and of course they've got issues insecure people come on somebody people that are insecure those who lack self-confidence are very difficult to lead sometimes because they always think they can't do it folks that are that, that lack self-confidence sometimes have to be told every step of the move, uh, uh, step of the way, because they're afraid to take responsibility and leadership and just make a decision because they, they're so insecure about themselves. So those people are hard to lead because you gotta tell them every single detail. Come on, somebody, you gotta stay on top of them and help them as well. And of course, the fifth one, and I have a list of a whole bunch more, but I, I cut it back to this: overly change resistant people. Come on. People that just don't want to change. Come on, somebody. People that just love where they are, and they're like, man, but we've done it this way for a thousand years. Come on, somebody. And at the end, that, or people that come to your church and say, man, at our ch church, we used to do it this way. And I'm like, well, you're not at your church anymore. You're at this church. So I hope you can submit to how we do things here, right? And when, I'm not, I don't mean that mean, but a lot of times people have a, a concept of what leadership or how things should be done. And at the end of the day, how many know that, that when, you, when you come to a place of, 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 of leadership, it can be challenging when you have these kind of people. But let me tell you something very important. How you follow determines how you lead. Come on, somebody. How you follow will determine how you lead. Because how you follow is how you lead yourself. So at the end of the day, we need to learn and understand that if you want to be, especially if you're aspiring to be a leader of some sort, just remember you're planting seeds into your own future by the way you follow others. Because how you follow others is how people are going to follow you. And the question I got to ask you today is this. Would you like people to follow you the way you follow others? Come on, somebody. So, so leadership is so important, but being a good follower makes you a great leader. Now, in the scripture, we've been talking about the four faces of leadership. Ezekiel saw the four awesome living creatures that stand around the throne of God. Now, he described these four faces as an eagle, an ox, a lion, of course, and a man. 
Now in Ezekiel 1.10 it says this. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man. Each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side. Each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side. And each of the four had the face of an eagle. What's that? Had face of an eagle as well. So you had the four faces. Could these four powerful creatures actually give us an insight? Could there actually be a model of leadership that we can actually tap into? Because how many know that everything God does, he does it intentionally? He, I mean, there's a lot of things that you read in the Bible. And if you ever see the words, and it is like, when you see it is like, that doesn't mean that it's exactly like it. It's like a lion. It's like this. Doesn't always mean that it's actually physically, literally what it is, but it looks like that or acts like that. Now, could these creatures do enough? Week number one, we started off, we discussed the face of the eagle. And the face of the eagle represents Christ's deity. It's, it's Christ, the, the God-man. See, so we, and we, and we did that, and of course, in week two, we discussed the face of the ox, which was last week. We talked about Jesus the servant. Jesus the servant. So today, we're going to talk about the face of the lion. Everybody say lion. lion. Everybody roar. Roar. You guys are awesome. I, I didn't think I was going to get any for this. I thought, you know, oh, that's corny, Pastor. Some of you actually did it. Praise God. I'm, I love that. The Lion of Judah was up in here. I love that. So the first thing, if you're filling out the blanks, is this. The Lion is a symbol of Christ, the King. How many of the Lion is the King of the jungle? Come on, somebody. The Lion is the King. So the, that actually signifies the King, his kingship. See, I, I love that. In the Gospel of Matthew... Is the, is the one that actually emphasizes his kingship. See, the Gospel of John emphasizes Jesus the creator. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. In John chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, it says, In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. In the beginning with God, all things that were made through him, and without, without him, nothing that was made was made. So, so John talks about, of course, Jesus, the creator. The second thing we talked about, that was last week, was the gospel of Mark. And, of course, Mark emphasizes Jesus, the servant. Now, we talked about last week the fact that G uh, Mark starts his, his, uh, his, uh, his gospel. He goes right into the story of John the Baptist. See, and the reason he did that is because he portrays Jesus as a servant. So a servant's genealogy is not important. Come on, somebody. So, this, so we see that. Now, today we're going to talk about Jesus the King. Now, this is very, very important to understand that because Matthew begins his writing with the genealogy that takes us back to Abraham. See, genealogies are important, important matters for those that are kings because if you're a king, then you have to have a family lineage. Come on, somebody. That shows you that you're in the royal family. Amen. It's a bloodline that has to be determined. So you see, Matthew begins with Abraham. And of course, it's pretty, pretty powerful. The, the gospel of Matthew depicts how Jesus fulfilled Old Testament prophecies and confirms the kingship of Jesus. You hear about the Sermon on the Mount. And that's, of course, the great purpose of the king. The Olivet Discourse, which is in Matthew 24, when he begins to share different areas of, of what's going to happen in the future. He talks about the major focus on prophecy and Israel's future. He predicts the destruction of the Jewish temple. He also goes into the end times. I reference Matthew 24 all the time, and you should look at it because I say all the time, it looks like our headlines. Come on, somebody. When you read Matthew 24, it talks about wars and rumors of wars. It talks about all the things that Jesus said would happen before the end came. So stay very, I mean, you need to look at that and read it, understand it, so that you can know the sign of the times. And of course, this is very interesting. The Gospel of Matthew does not close with the record of the ascension. See, a lot of the other books close with Jesus going up to heaven. Come on, somebody. This book does not. Why? Because the king remains on earth. Come on, somebody. His kingship is here. It lives in every one of us as well. So you see, when you look at the different areas of, of, of Matthew, you'll see that it's very, very prevalent to kingship. Now, the second thing is this. Matthew establishes a kingdom priority. 
He establishes a kingdom priority. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, we know this, right? But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. If you read right before that scripture, you'll see a list of things. He says, don't worry about clothes. Don't worry about these things. I mean, don't worry about the material needs that you have in this world. Because if you seek first the kingdom, come on, everybody say amen. Amen. If you seek first the kingdom of God, then all these things are added on to you. When you take your focus off the physical things of this world and you put them on God, then God begins to provide. Why? Because when you do that, your priorities are in order. Come on, survive. You put Jesus at the center of your life. And when you do that, now everything rotates around the Lord that's in the center. And he's able to bring the things to pass that he needs to do in your life. Especially because he wants us to fulfill our assignment. Everybody say assignment. We're on this planet with a purpose. Come on, somebody. Every single one of us has been called individually. You've already been equipped. You're enabled. You've already got everything inside of you that God wanted to put inside of you before he brought you to this planet. Because the Bible says that before the foundations of the earth, before he ever said in the beginning, before Genesis, before he said, let there be light, you were already on his mind. Come on, somebody. You were already in his heart. The fact that you showed up at this time in history was not an accident. Come on. Your mama might, may, may, it might have been an accident for your mama and your daddy. They, they might have not planned it. It might have been like, surprise. But, you know, God was not surprised. Come on, somebody. And God had you here for a purpose. So we need to understand that God has us here for such a time as this. And you see, when you start making God's word a priority... And the object of of your obedience, it draws God's favor and his material blessings as well. See, when you start seeking after God, why, why do you believe that God actually will bless you when you seek him first? There's something about seeking the blesser and not the blessing. There's something about getting closer to God. So when we seek God first, all of a sudden the proximity of our distance between us and God begins to close in. The Bible says if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. So if we continue to do that, then we get closer to God. And the closer we get to God, guess what happens to us? We begin to change. Come on, somebody. Our desires begin to change. There's an old song. I used to love singing it way back in the day. They used to say, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things on earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, the closer we get to Jesus, come on, somebody, all of a sudden, all the bling of the world, all the things that attract us in the world, they begin to get really dim And Jesus, come on, somebody, and his glory is so much bigger and so much better. Come on, somebody. And all of a sudden, the desires of this world begin to just kind of fall to the wayside. And all of a sudden, now you want to see God even more. See, the cool thing about seeking God is the more you do it, the more you want to do it. The closer you get to God, the closer you want to be to God. Because God begins to draw you in. And I don't know about you, I'm addicted to God's presence. Come on, somebody. I, I, when I drive in my vehicle and I put on my praise and worship music, man, I'm having church. Come on, somebody. In my car. I don't, people are looking at me all crazy. I, I, I lift one hand. Come on, not both. <laughs> I might lift one hand as I'm driving. I, I, I mean, I, I love having church. You know, as a brand new Christian, I used to travel a lot. And uh, when I worked for IBM, right, and I would get on 95 to 85 and go to South Hill. One of my accounts was in South Hill. So I would make that trip. That's about an hour and a half, maybe an hour and 20-minute ride. I would love it. Like, I would be like, man, I'm having church in the car. Come on now. I would put my music on first. I mean, I mean worship is important. So I put a worship tape on for the first 20 minutes. I just said tape, didn't I? Come on, somebody. I am dating myself big time. I didn't say MP4. Come on, somebody. I said cassette tape, man. We're going all the way back. Some of y'all got eight tracks, though. I don't know. Some of y'all go back a little further than that. The only problem with them eight tracks, man, they get stuck. How many remember eight tracks? We just get, some of y'all, yeah, some folks know. All right. Some of the other folks go, we have no idea what a heck an eight track is. 
But we used to put a, how many guys do the full paper up and slide it between the eight track? Okay, maybe you guys don't know. Some, of the, some, of, some folks know what I'm talking about. I keep that thing from skipping. Come on, y'all did that. Come on. But at the end of the day, you know, you see that, that, uh, that, um, that we really have to be close to God. And as we get closer to the Lord, he gets closer to us. He always moves on our behalf to the degree that we move towards him. See, a lot of things that God does, how many of the God's grace and his mercy, come on, somebody. How many of his mercy, there's no strings attached? See, there's no strings attached. His mercy is just mercy. We deserve judgment. He says, I'm going to give you mercy. It's like going before a judge and saying, I got no excuses. I broke the law. I did what I did. You know, I just throw myself at the mercy of the court. At the end of the day, we have a merciful God. Come on, somebody. He would rather, you, he would rather give you mercy than give you judgment. So once you understand God's grace, then you begin to say, wow, this is an awesome, awesome God. You see, when you keep your priorities straight, when we keep our spiritual priorities in order, see, while pursuing our dreams, listen, let me tell you what the biggest challenge is that I know I go through and I guarantee most of us in this room do, is chasing after your ambitions, your desires, your success, but keeping God in the right place. It's so easy because we can be driven to, to do things for, and we can actually leave God behind at times. Sometimes it's easy to go after the things and forget that God is there. It's very easy to do that. So we have to make a, a real conscious effort. How many of we have to be intentional? Everybody say intentional. intentional. You got to be so intentional to realize, do I have God in the right place? As I'm going forward in my life, nothing wrong with prospering. Nothing wrong with success. Nothing wrong with having all the material things that God has blessed you with. At the end of the day, be prosperous. But if you keep God as a priority in your life, amen, if you, how many of that when you tithe, it keeps God a priority in your finances? Because it actually helps you from becoming materialistic. When you realize that God, everything he has is his. Everything that he has, he can use as well. So you see, it's very difficult at times, so we have to be super, super conscious that we keep God a priority, especially in the area of our finances. You know, in 1903, there was an ambitious young man named James who moved to Chicago desiring to become the most successful cheese salesman in the world. I mean, that's a pretty cool thing to want, <laughs> to sell lots of cheese, right? But he was a dedicated Christian man, a hard worker, okay? And of course, despite all the long hours and the hard work, he was making very, very little profit. One day he stopped the wagon. He, had a, he actually had bought a little horse named Patty. And of course, and he had a wagon. And I thought about that. I was reading this. I said, Patty wagon. Come on, somebody. In Chicago, that's what we used to call. Some of y'all don't know what I'm talking about. All right, some of y'all never been in the back of one of those. I know Wayne probably drove a few of those. I'm not sure. Uh, some of the law enforcement guys go, yeah, we know what Patty Wagon is. But, but I thought about that. I wonder if that's where it got its name from. But anyway, let me tell you why. Because the, 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 the horse's name was Patty. He would drag the wagon. And one day after all these months of working and realizing, man, there's no headway. I'm not making it. One day he just kind of pulled the wagon over one day. He said, you know, Patty, this ain't working. I said, you know what? Maybe I'm working too hard at doing what, what I want to do. And what about if I put Jesus in the center of it? So him and Patty had a talk. Come on, somebody. How many know when you're talking to your horse, you're probably pretty desperate at that time? <laughs> now, if the horse starts talking back, you got real issues. Yeah, yeah. Unless he's Mr. Ed. Come on, somebody. <laughs> so now some of the young folks go, who's that? <laughs> so, so anyway, so he talks to his horse. He said, man, you know what? I don't know. And then finally he said, you know, Patty, you and I got to do something. We're going to put God first. He was a Christian man. He said, you know what? I've been working so hard at this. I'm not making any headway. Let's make Jesus first. Let's make sure we prioritize our lives. So he began to do that. And when he did that, he stopped working on Sunday. Come on, somebody. He decided he's going to start observing the Sabbath. So he stopped selling cheese on Sunday. All of a sudden, how many of you know not working on Sunday is a pretty good thing? Right. If you don't believe me, just call Chick-fil-A. Come on, somebody. One of the fastest growing, I mean, that's one of the most successful 
uh, fast food places on the planet and they're closed on Sunday. Because how many know that when you obey the Sabbath and you put everything in order, then God takes those six days, come on somebody, and multiplies them over and over again because they observe the Sabbath. Well, long story short, he began to prosper. All of a sudden, the sales of his company began to just rise. I mean, he was, then all of a sudden, he, he began to grow so quickly. Eventually, he grew a big corporation and, and went international and started buying other companies that had food products as well. And of course, this gentleman that I'm talking about, uh, that we're talking about, Mr. James, his last name was Kraft. So if you ever heard of Kraft Foods, anybody in the house? That's the way Kraft Food started. A man of God selling cheese on the street in Chicago. And today it's one of the biggest conglomerations on the planet. But he kept God first. He gave God a priority in his life. And when we do that as well, we'll see God's hand in everything that we do. And the last thing is this. First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 8 says this. From the Gadites... There came over to David mighty men of valor, listen to this, whose faces were like faces of lions. When you read this story, this is so powerful. Because remember, Gad, if you, if you think about Gad, does anybody know who came from Gad? Come on, somebody said Goliath. Somebody knows their Bible. Come on, somebody. Either that or you took a good guess. Come on now. At the end of the day, that's right, uh, uh, Goliath was from Gad. That means these had to be some big dudes. Come on, somebody. And their faces were like lions. They were warriors. So you see, the third thing is this, be prepared to fight. Come on, somebody. At the end of the day, we have to get to a place in our lives where we have to be willing to go to battle. Come on now. Yeah. See, we know we serve a God that also fights our battles, amen? We know we serve a God that allows us, but how many know that sometimes we have to engage as well? Yeah. See, in the battle that we fight, when we stand for Jesus, we fight on our knees. Come on, somebody. Yeah. At the end of the day, you begin to take spiritual warfare, understand the authority that we have, understand the power that you have. When you get on your knees and start praying to God, you can tear down strongholds. Come on, somebody. You can set the captive free wherever they are. When you begin to pray, it's, you're entering into a supernatural realm, and God can do stuff that none of us could ever think or imagine. See, God is able to do, come on, exceedingly, abundantly, more than we could ever ask or think. See, when we go into prayer, and that's an area of our lives that, man, we got, listen, I got to encourage you, man. The more you pray, the more power you'll have. Amen. The more you pray, you'll see God do supernatural stuff. I mean, how bad do you want your unsaved loved ones saved? When's the last time you fasted and prayed for them? When's the last time you wanted God to do something powerful in your life and you were willing to sacrifice, come on, that Big Mac, come on somebody, for lunch? When's the last time you just wanted it so bad you'd say, God, I'm not going to, I'm going to sacrifice, I'm going to pray. But how many know that we pray not from a place of defeat? We pray from a posture of victory, come on somebody. Because how many know the devil's already defeated? See, we're fighting a foe that's already been defeated. The Bible says he's under our feet. He's not, come on, somebody. So if he's under your feet, why do we give him so much credit for all the stuff that's going on my, in your life? Listen, the Bible, I hear Christians say this all the time. Oh, the devil's on my back. The devil's on my back. Put him under your feet. Come on, somebody. Put him where he belongs. Get him off your back. Boy, that, that was loud, dude. Some of y'all went like this. Was that the Holy Ghost or was this, was this loud? At the end of the day, listen, move, move his position. He doesn't belong on your back. He belongs under your feet. He's defeated, amen? And begin to take authority over that devil. Say enough is enough. Draw a line in the sand and say, devil, no, no, no more. You're not going to have your way in my family. You're going to have your way anywhere else. You see, a lion is fearless. And David had the heart of a lion. See, Saul, there was the, when, when, they, when they came back from battle, the people were singing, Saul killed thousands, but David killed tens of thousands. Come on, somebody. See, David was a warrior. He understood the power. And he, even as a young guy, man, he was a, he had, he was a slingshot professional. Come on, somebody. Amen. He killed a bear 
Come on, he killed a lion. So how much easier was gonna be to kill this giant? How many of like killing a lion is no joke? That's a big animal, y'all. I mean, you ever go to, have you ever been to the zoo and actually looked at a lion? Those dudes are big. And he took out a lion, he took out a bear. So when he saw this giant from Gad, he's like, dude, I killed these guys. You are gonna be a piece of cake. And, in the and you come at me with a javelin and a sword, but I come with you in the name of Jesus. Come on, somebody. In the power of the Holy Spirit. And when he slung that bad boy, he was ready. You know, I could imagine how much time David spent practicing with that slingshot. Because he was in the desert all the time with those sheep. He was always practicing. Always practicing. And of course, how many of you probably missed quite a few, but he started getting better. How many of you need to practice our faith? How many know we need to exercise our faith? And you see, we need to start believing God. We need to start praying more. Start believing. Listen, when somebody comes up to you and begins to share their issues, just say this. Man, you know what? That's terrible. Come on, let's pray. You could be in a 7-Eleven. Come on now. You could be, Rosa used to always be like, oh my God, here he goes again. That food line, I'll be walking around and I hear a conversation and I step right in and it's like, this was early in our marriage and like, dude, dude you have to pray for everybody in the store. Come on, somebody. Uh, and, and not just pray, come on, somebody. I didn't just pray, I, I was loud praying. I want everybody around me to hear me. I wasn't trying to be like, whatever. In the name of Jesus. And the people at the register, there you go, what, who's, what was that? Just like y'all did a second ago, right? And then I pray loud and then I walk away. And then and it's like, man, gosh, you have to, can you keep the tone down just a little bit? At the end of the day, listen, guys, God has given us that power. Come on now. We just got to do it. We have to look and be proactive for opportunities. Did you know the more you pray, the more you believe? You know that these healing ministry guys, before they finally started seeing, before Oral Roberts probably began to heal, when God began to move in him, he was probably laying hands on people for years and nothing happened. Come on now. See, nothing happened, but he continued and he continued. All of a sudden, the anointing and the Holy Spirit, and because he practiced his faith, not because God can't heal, because we have to believe it. Come on, somebody. We have to be at a place where we understand that God can do it. And when he gets to that place, when you get to that place, you'll see all kinds of amazing situations. See, we have to become, or we have to overcome a spirit of intimidation. How I many of the devil is a liar? And the devil is always trying to intimidate us and bring fear into our lives. So at the end of the day, we need to flow in the power. See, the lion is not afraid. As a leader, a lion is not afraid to make hard calls and make hard decisions as well. See, as a lion, we need to understand if you're a leader and you're a lion, and I know some of y'all are, because I could tell, I, I know the way I, when I talk to you that you're that type of a leader that just gets things done. Come on, somebody. That get, just drives what they need to do and get it done. At the end, you need to realize that we as men and women of God, he is the lion of Judah. Come on, somebody. The Bible calls him the lion. But if that means that that lion, come on, lives inside of you, come on now, then you can roar just like him. And when you open your mouth and begin to pray, like I said before, when you speak like him, you speak for him. God's word. You see, uh, I love it because as a person, as a leader, especially as a child of God, be prepared to defend the gospel. Have, the Bible says be prepared in season and out of season because people are going to ask you questions. And we need to be equipped to answer why we believe what we believe. And at the end of the day, as men and women of God, we should not be ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ for it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. Now I'm going to close with this story. It was the year 1519, just a few years ago, right? And Hernan Cortez, everybody remember that in school? Cortez, the conqueror. So he crosses over because the Mayan Indians in Mexico have one of the greatest, they've been hoarding treasures for a long time. They are conquerors themselves. But nobody has ever been able to conquer the Mayans. So he sets across the ocean with 600 guys. 600. 
That's like, my goodness, are you kidding me? You're going, you're going to go into an empire full of people with 600 of your soldiers, and you think you're going to overcome this amazing Mayan culture, this big, giant empire. Well, he does something very interesting. So when they, they loaded, they got to the beach, and they, they had all the boats floating around. He began to give them a pep talk. Come on, come on. You guys ever see Braveheart? Yep. Yep. One of the coolest scenes ever. When he's on that horse, and they're all lined up to go to battle. And he just starts getting, he starts taking that, oh, that's all. Oh, anybody ever see that? Am I the only one? Okay, man, forget that. Forget that movie then. Y'all haven't seen it. But, but it's a pep talk. It's a pep talk. He's getting these people ready to go into battle. They're getting ready to fight. So what, so what Cortez does, he does the same thing. He takes his 600 guys, and he puts them across the beach. And he begins to talk to them, saying, hey, guys, you know, we're getting ready to go in. I'm not sure if we're coming back on this one. But if we do, we're going to be rich. These folks got big time money. They got gold and silver and treasures beyond whatever we could ever imagine. So they're facing him as he's talking to them. And right behind them, they can't see what's happening. He's burning the ships. Come on, somebody. He said, they turned around. I said, I want you guys to turn around for a moment. They all look back. All the ships are on fire. The ships are starting to sink. And he says, listen, guys, two things can happen here today. Either we're going to win this battle or we're going to die. But one way or another, we're going to have to fight. Some of us have ships that have to be burned. Some of us have ships to our past because we use it as a, as a plan B. We say, you know what, uh, if, if it don't go good, we can swim out to the ship, get back on the boat, go back where I came from. He said, no, 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 in this battle, you burn the ships and you go in all the way. And do you know those 600 soldiers, when they were backed against the wall, had nowhere else to go? They won the battle. They conquered the Mayan Indians in that battle. True story. When I thought about that story today, I thought, how many of us have ships that are floating just in case? Just in case this Christianity thing doesn't work out. Just in case this situation happens. Just in case. How many of you God is our plan A and there is no plan B? Come on, I'll give the Lord a praise if you believe that. Because we need to learn to fight to know that there's nowhere to go back to. The moment we do that, something on the inside is going to happen. And I believe the church is ready to rise up, y'all. There are some people, man, I, listen, we're having another prayer meeting. Come on now. What's the date for that? 29? 29. Man, it's time to get busy in prayer. The battles that we're fighting, the battles that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness. The battle you and I are fighting are not with the people around us. There's an enemy, come on somebody, a spiritual enemy that's constantly coming against the church, constantly coming against you as well. And you're getting angry at people around you because they're opposing you. That's just the devil manipulating things around you. And you need to understand that the moment you know who your enemy really is, then you're ready to win the battle. And when you're determined and say, there's no turning back, I'm either all in to win or I'm not. When we get to that place where we burn those, bridge, uh, burn those bridges and burn those boats, you're going to see something happen. Because at that point, the Holy Spirit, come on, and all his angels, the host of heaven will be there with you as well. How many know we don't fight alone? Come on, somebody. We have a whole host of angels that are ready to battle with us as well. And all we need to do is have faith to believe God. Because the Bible says this, the victory is ours, but the battle is his. And if we learn to stand in the gap and battle with God and let him take the lead, then every battle we fight, we will not lose. Every obstacle will come down. Every wall, every stronghold 
in Jesus' name, when the body of Christ, when all of us in this room decide, we have to make a decision. Listen to me. Decide to be free. Decide to be whole. Decide that the devil can no longer do stuff in our families. Come on, somebody. That the devil can no longer take our finances and mess it up. That the devil has no power in our lives because we are children of the living God. We are heirs to the throne. And when we walk with that power, come on, somebody. How many know God's going to show up? And when he shows up, he doesn't lose any battles. When God shows up, everything begins to change. If you believe that, put your hands together one time. Let's all stand to our feet tonight.